Hello everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Haynes, I'm Head of Product Management for GC Asia and today I'm going to talk about uh, a new composite material, Genial Universal Injectable and as part of that I'm going to talk through about uh, bonding material, G Premio Bond and go into a bit of the history uh, behind the development of these materials. When we look at these materials, we're looking at a, a system approach uh, to, to restoring teeth uh, which is designed to be quick, efficient, high quality restorations, but most important we're looking for durability in these restorations. In looking and understanding why we've developed these materials, what I want to do today is I want to go back in time. I actually want to look, take a, a historical approach on looking at the background behind the research that's driven and influence GC to develop these materials. One of the challenges in looking at durability of restorations is the fact that water and oral fluids are, are a major problem in, in achieving durability and so the background screen for my PowerPoint with the uh, water globules is, is there for a reason uh, because this is the biggest challenge we have uh, to achieving durability. So today I'm going to talk about a background on adhesion and understanding degradation. I want to look at the new bonding technologies and G Premio Bond. I want to then look at filler technologies and the genial universal injectable material. Uh, but first, uh, a few words about GC and uh, I want to tell you uh, a bit about the company. We're a private dental company. We're uh, owned by a family and, and run by the uh, grandson, Mr. Nakao, and Dr. Nakao, the great-grandson of the original founders. And in, 19, in, in 1921, we were founded. In 2021, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary. And the company uh, is founded on uh, a couple of very strong principles, and these have influenced uh, what we do and are important uh, as far as understanding how a company works. The first is quality management and GC's quality management. And um, as a major focus in producing the best materials, this is an underlying uh, systematic approach that we've applied to how the, run, the company is run. In 2004, GC uh, was, able, was awarded with the uh, Japan Quality Medal, which is the highest, if you like, the pinnacle of quality management that you can achieve and we're one of only 28 companies now that have achieved that standard. And every two years and as an ongoing uh, commitment to quality there's actually a survey that's held um, where major manufacturers uh, compete for a quality ranking and the latest quality ranking actually has GC Corporation at the top of Japanese manufacturers and service industries. The other area that's really important to GC is R&D, and R&D is king. So if anyone's going to get money allocated in the organisation, it's R&D, and that's where the commitment is. And you'll see here pictures of the Prosto Research Centre, which is in Nagoya. And this is where we do our core research on resin materials. And you can see... Uh, uh, the company has decided to create a space that is conducive for the free mind and free thinking that we need in R&D. The main research centre is in Tokyo and this is probably the best shot of the building because if you go around the side it's actually quite an ugly building, it's a long warehouse, no windows, um, but when you go inside the ceiling is all glass it's a huge atrium and it's built in a classic, a classic Rutherford style. And this is where all the researchers sit on the inside and the research laboratories are sitting around the outside where of course we do all our R&D. And this is the largest private dental research centre in the world. And at the bottom we, we have our CAD CAM milling and our CAD CAM technology. And of course this is where, you know, looking at the future, this is an important part of where we're thinking. In talking about adhesion and thinking about what's important with adhesion, it's not just about getting good bond strengths, it's got to be about durability. And why is durability so important? Well, 
it's particularly important now for a number of reasons. The first thing is, of course, with Minamata, we've got a situation where amalgam is going to be phased out over a number of years, and so it's not going to be a restorative material option that we have. We also have an aging population, and this is a, a, a global phenomenon, but the important thing about the aging population is their desire to be dentate. And so we have restorative procedures that we need to survive for a long time. And of course, when we look at the repeat restoration cycle, we're looking at a cycle that typically involves more loss of tooth structure each time you replace the restoration. So we're thinking more and more about minimally invasive restorations. But when we think of how often are we replacing restorations, it's interesting, there was a publication in 2017 looking at longevity of restorations, anterior restorations. And you'll see the large number nearly 73,000 composite restorations placed on nearly 30,000 patients, 47 dental practitioners, and the annual failure rate was 4.6% per annum. If you look at that over five years, you're essentially looking at nearly a quarter of the restorations needed to be replaced every five years. But you also note the significance that if you're older, if you're over 65, the rate of replacement was 81% 80, higher. So we're looking at a high replacement rate of restorations. Also what was interesting from this paper was the difference in annual failure rate between clinician. We had a variation between 2% and 11% annual failure rate. And that's, say in five years time, that's the difference between 10% of restorations requiring replacement versus over 50% of those restorations requiring replacement. So the challenge we have is durability, but actually the big challenge that we have in impeding that durability is actually durability of adhesion within a biological fluid contaminated oral environment. So in looking at adhesion, I'm going to go back in time now and look at how we developed our bonding to dentine and what's gone on with dentine adhesion. Previous to 1982, we knew that bonding to resin didn't, uh, bond, sorry, bonding with resin to dentine was not able to produce high bond strengths. If we flowed resin down dentinal tubules, it didn't create an interlocking that pr produced high bond strengths. And bonding to the smear layer was not successful. What happened in 1982 is Nakabayashi identified the hybrid zone. And this was a zone of intertubular dentine that was etched and infiltrated with resin. So that that resin infiltration into that demineralized zone, intermingled with the collagen, could produce high bond strengths. And in fact, the bond strengths were virtually on a par with bond strengths to enamel. And this really caused great excitement because we could think in terms of bonded restorations to dentine with similar adhesive bond strengths to enamel. And so we saw this period through the 80s of 90s where we had total etch, total seal, total success. But in vitro testing was showing, this, showing us a few warning signs. We were seeing that over time we saw degradation of the resin we saw that over time, in looking at the hybrid layer, we saw some breakdown of the collagen. And so a lot of questions were going to be asked. And from that, we saw really the first significant paper where we saw the first in vitro testing, sorry, in vivo testing of dentine bonding in a cl clinical trial run by Professor Sano. And so this was Tokyo Dental Medical College, Hakata University, and David Pashley from Georgia, looking specifically at what happens to the interface where we've bonded to dentine, comparing one day versus 365 days. What's the difference between those two interfaces? And what they found in looking at those two interfaces is that the hybrid layer literally disappeared. They saw the resin had gone they saw indication of breakdown of collagen, 
but they also saw degradation of the composite and the composite surface adjacent to where that was bonded. And this is where the conclusion, the first conclusion was drawn that maybe this hybrid layer wasn't a stable layer. This trial was undertaken on a monkey model and the next step in the process was actually looking at a human model. And so the second in vivo trial looked at in vivo degradation in humans over one to three years, looking at primary dentition. And in this, in this trial, Scotch bond multipurpose restorations bonded Z100 into occlusal restorations in primary dentition. And then over the course of the next three years, as permanent molars came through, the primary molars were extracted and they looked at the interface. And again, exactly the same findings. They found resin disappearing, they found collagen breaking down, and they found the composite restorations underneath were showing signs of degradation. Filler particles were being lost. And again, the conclusion, if we want longevity in this bond, we need to get rid of the hybrid layer. So our understanding of the problem then can be divided into three areas. The resin seems to be disappearing. And what we're looking at is degradation of hydrophilic resin components. Exposed collagen is disappearing. It seems to be an enzymatic degradation, but from where? What's causing this degradation? And the composite interface itself, the composite structure is breaking down and they could visibly see the loss of fillers from the composite. And so the question mark goes back to the silane degradation, the silane being the way we bond composite particles or filler particles into the resin structure. This was the time now where GC got very much involved in the research because the question had to be asked, what is the adhesive mechanism that will give us a durable dentine interface? How can we get long-lasting restorations, how can we maintain that bond? And so we saw subsequent to that two clinical trials, again using a monkey model, but looking at two different scenarios. The first scenario was looking at Unifil bond, a mild self-etching bonding agent from GC, and it was a two-step, a primer and a bond, compared to single bond, and single bond being a total etch single component bonding agent. The second trial was comparing the same Unifil bond, mild self-etching designed for chemical bonding with a glass on of a bonding agent, Fuji Bond LC. Now Fuji Bond LC, you're probably familiar with Fuji 2 LC. Fuji Bond LC is a resin reinforced glass on sort of like a Fuji 2LC that's got a much lower powder liquid ratio, so its viscosity is like a bonding agent. The basis of its adhesion is glass anima, but its formulation has much more resin in it, and the resin that we use in it is a water-soluble resin called HEMA. Now looking, looking at this trial and looking at the comparison between these two bonding methods, there were some important outcomes. The first thing was when they looked at the difference between one day and one year, they could see that the Fuji Bond LC was able to maintain stability at the adhesive interface, but showed signs of degradation in itself. And we looked at that and we thought, okay, the glass on them are bonding is working, but physically the material is weakening. And we relate that to the HEMA component of the material starting to degrade. And when we looked at Unifil bond, we saw exactly the same situation. We saw stability at the bonded interface because Unifil bond was a mild self-etching bond designed to chemically bond to hydroxyapatite. We were not exposing collagen. And the thought there was, because we were using our functional monomer format, that this was bonding chemically to the hydroxyapatite that had remained around the collagen fibrils because we weren't aggressively etching that surface. So by 2002, from GC's perspective, we had a very clear indication of how we could get 
stability at the adhesive interface via chemical bonding, but we could still see that hydrophilic resins are going to degrade over time. The next question that was asked, which related to this trial here, was as part of the placement of the single bond, there was etching of dentine and exposure of collagen. And the researchers wanted to question, how is the collagen degrading? What is, what is the mechanism? Is it because we've got a margin on dentine and with leakage on a dentine margin, we've got external enzymes that are able to go in and break down the collagen? Or is there some other process that is going on? So in this trial, the cavities were prepared with all margins on enamel and dentine exposed. So all margins on our, were on enamel with the thought that if we can seal all the margins, maybe we can stop the degradation process with the total etch technique. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And when they looked at a one-year-old hybrid layer, what they saw was a hybrid layer that had completely destructed. So previously, this intertubular dentine was infiltrated with resin. But now, essentially, that hybrid layer had disappeared. There was remnants of resin. And we saw there was still the resin that had flowed down the smear down these, sorry, the tubules. But essentially, we look at destruction of the hybrid layer. So, again, a very clear indication to us, and the third really important paper looking at in vivo bond strengths and degradation over the time, the hybrid layer is not stable. We saw all the resin had, virtually all the resin had gone and collagen had literally disappeared. So even if we've got all enamel margins, the problem is still there. The other characteristic, again repeated, was the breakdown of the filler particles from the resin matrix and the composite lying above it. We were also looking not only at a breakdown of the bonding, we were looking at breakdown of composite. And this issue of hydrolysis, our problem with water, is ongoing. So by 2004, it was very clear for us, etching dentine leads to collagen degradation, hydrophilic resins that we include in our bonding agents degrade, and silane technology needs improvement. So I want to talk about solutions, but before I do that, I'll, I'll venture on and say what's happened since then. And I think there's been numerous, uh, numerous publications and a lot of research that's gone into trying to understand why is the collagen degrading. And as a review, as a review paper to refer, refer to, there's a good number of them about. This in particular is a good one from Mazzoni. Why does collagen break down? Collagen breaks down because enzymes, matrix metal proteinases within collagen are activated by the etching process. These, these the same enzymes that are activated when caries from acid from um, bacterial biofilms is progressing through the tooth. And these simply break down the collagen. So as soon as collagen is exposed and if it's not protected by resin, it's going to break down in this environment. And so a huge range of strategies uh, constantly um, uh, under review and tested to see if we can stop this breakdown. MMP inhibitors like chlorhexidine as a pretreatment, ethanol wet bonding, new, f new initiation systems, new resins with grafted MMP inhibitors, remineralization strategies, bioactive glass strategies, but no one's come out with a simple answer and a simple solution. And we're still left with the basic problem that if you're going to etch dentine and expose collagen, it's very, very challenging to reseal it and protect it to ensure long-term durability of adhesion. In looking at, <clears throat> say, one of the options suggested, chlorhexidine, this 
publication from 2017 looked at a clinical trial on the use of chlorhexidine as a pretreatment um, before placement of dentine bonding agent. It was a three-year trial, split mouth, triple blinded, non-curious cervical lesions, a 2% chlorhexidine or a placebo applied after etching before single bond 2 and Filtex Supreme was applied. Three years down the track, they wanted to see was there a difference in retention by using the chlorhexidine pretreatment, and there wasn't. The annual failure rate for these restorations reporting in the trial was 8.4%, and although it wasn't significant, actually the placebo was slightly better from a retention point of view. The application of chlorhexidine as an MMP inhibitor did not influence the retention. And the interesting thing was this matched exactly the same results from a similar trial reporting three-year results, that the chlorhexidine had not been effective in this situation at stopping or, or slowing down the degradation process. And the thought there is that perhaps the chlorhexidine, because it's not bound to a structure and it's just loosely applied, that the effect of the chlorhexidine is short term and not long term. But certainly at this stage, there's not strong clinical evidence to support the use of chlorhexidine as a pretreatment. The other question of the course is why do hydrophilic resins degrade? Why does HEMA degrade? And the simple answer to that is when we take HEMA and polymerize it and compare it to the sort of resins we use in our composites like TEDMA or BisGMA or urethane dimethacrylate, when we polymerize these sorts of materials, they are hard. If you soak them in water for a couple of weeks, they stay hard. But with HEMA, once polymerized, leave it for two weeks in water, it uptakes a lot of water, goes through a plasticization process, and ends up quite soft. And this is the mode of degradation of the hydrophilic resin in a bonding environment. The process is potentially worsened by the etching process. Because when we look at dentine, we're looking at mineralized dentine. It's 50% mineral, 25% collagen, 25% water. When we etch it, we're essentially changing that surface to a surface that's now 75% water, 25% collagen that you're bonding to. Now when you buy a bottle of bonding agent, say a single bottle bond like that single bond two that was used in the trial, all the components, the hydrophilic, the hydrophobic components, the initiators, ethanol, water, they're all mixed and stable in that formulation. But when you take that formulation and apply it to a surface that's got 75% water, what happens is that higher water component causes a separation out of the components, phase separation. And phase separation can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. And unfortunately in this situation, it tends to be a bad thing. Because what we end up, when we actually look at what the hybrid layer looks like, is we look at the separation out of the components. We look at the hydrophobic components, BisGMA in this case, and single bond two, and the hydrophilic component, HEMA, separated out. So we might have imagined this beautiful hybrid layer as being the infiltration of various resins to give a strong hybrid layer, but it's not. It's an infiltration of HEMA into a demineralized zone to form the hybrid layer. Now the problem with it is that that hybrid layer was full of water. And what the HEMA does as it's penetrating into the hybrid layer is it uptakes water. And then when we initiate polymerization and set the material, we actually find that the physical properties of the polymerized HEMA here are vastly different than the physical properties of the polymerized HEMA here. Because this material 
has absorbed a lot of moisture, a lot of water, and one research finding was that the physical properties are one one hundredth the physical properties of the polymerized hema here. So we end up with a significant wig zone at the base of the hybrid zone of polymerized hema. The more water, the more water uptake, the greater the problem. And you can imagine, particularly with deep dentine, as we get close to the pulp and the tubule density gets higher, we see much more of this water problem and we see faster degradation. Again, a very good review paper for 2010 from Paulette Spencer's group looked at what we know about the hybrid loan, but in particular was referring to the research that's gone on in looking at HEMA in the hybrid layer. And we understand that the demineralized dentine matrix is infiltrated by HEMA. It has a low cross-link density. It absorbs water, and that leads to plasticization and breakdown of the adhesive. There's also concerns as to the degree of conversion of the HEMA and concerns as to where the photoinitiator is actually localised in the bonding agent. And of course, if you've got HEMA and it's not well polymerised and it's breaking down, the other concerns is unreacted components being released into the mouth. Anyway, that's state of the art of where we are in looking at HEMA. So, back to our understanding of the problem. This is actually a restoration which is symptomless, apart from the fact that there's a periodontal problem, so it's going to be extracted. It's got a 10-year-old composite restoration. No problems, a symptomless. Scotch bond multipurpose was the adhesive. It's going to be extracted and sectioned across here. Okay, so we're going to be sectioning, and we've got an enamel margin here. So under the SEM, this is the enamel margin here, here. And we're going to look at the interface with dentine. There's two locations on the dentine we're going to look at. The difference between these two locations is pulpal fluid. This is dentine here that's not directly connected by positive pulpal fluid flow. And this is dentine here that is directly connected to positive pulpal fluid flow. Ten years old, hybrid layer intact, looks fine. The bonding worked, no problems. Ten year old hybrid layer here, and please excuse this artifact, this is what once was the hybrid layer. It simply doesn't exist. The resin adhesive doesn't exist. The collagen that was supporting the hybrid layer doesn't exist. And what you see here is the degradation of the composite. And this is the sort of degradation that is consistently seen on the underside of these restorations where filler particles are literally lost, dislodged, disappeared. And the degradation process is not only one of the dentine of the bonding agent, but also the underside of the composite. So for us, for GCR&D, and what has stimulated our research thinking and what has been the driving force behind us wanting to improve the durability of restorations, this set the benchmark. So the first thing is glass onomers are incredibly important. As an adhesive interface with dentine, they can handle the water. They're water-based cement. They allow fluid movement, but they chemically bond to the dentine. And the long-term durability and stability of that chemical bond is proven. It works. And the fact that this material as an adhesive material, and of course it's a restorative material as well, but the fact that it's water-based means that it has pretty minimal technique sensitivity. And that's why glass on a cement maintains its position as an extremely good and adhesive material, and of course a restorative material. Clearly, we need to do something about bonding agents. And so from this, 
we moved away with a clear strategy that a bonding agent needed to have hydrophobic resin only. We needed to focus on chemical bonding and we should avoid at all costs exposing collagen. We needed to be able to reduce the technique sensitivity of applying bonding in a wet environment where we needed to get rid of the water. And this led to the development of G-Bond. And the third area, which is a major pillar in research, is about improving the silane technology in composite resins, in composite restorations. And with that, and with applied to new filler technology, we've developed a range of solutions from coating materials through to new composite resin materials. I'm going to start by looking at G-Bond and, and look at the bonding technology. G-Bond was released in 2004, directly influenced from the research findings that had come through very clearly on degradation of adhesives. It was focused on chemical bonding using format and a phosphate ester monomer, uh, essentially a, a 10 MDP monomer, used to chemically bond to hydroxyapatite on the dentine surface. And we were not exposing collagen, and Sano described this zone that we wanted to create as a nano interaction zone. The search, rather than to create good hybrid zones, really we wanted to create good chemical bonding zones and so therefore the nano interaction zone is that zone of chemical bonding that we're searching for. And with that we wanted to use hydrophobic resin. We knew that HEMA would degrade. But in making a bond we also knew that we had to have water. So we somehow needed water because we need that for a chemical reaction to the tooth but we wanted to get rid of the water. So we developed the bond with a technique whereby it was applied to the tooth surface for 10 seconds maximum, that's all, but then used high pressure air dry. So rather than gently air dry, which was the norm for bonding agents, gently air dry to evaporate off the ethanol, we were different. We were saying we want you to aggressively dry the tooth because we want to get rid of all the water. We do not want any water in the bonding agent. And then immediately after doing that, we're going to light cure it to fix it. Now, if you didn't use aggressive air, the water formed globules in the bonding agent. Now, you won't see that with any other bonding agent because other bonding agents use HEMA. And if we had HEMA in the bond here, it simply absorbs the water, so you don't see it. Whereas G-Bond didn't have HEMA in it. So any water that was left in the bond layer appeared, appeared as a water globule. However, if you blew with high air, you're simply drying the restoration. There was no water left in the bonding agent. We had a stable bond. The other advantage of blasting with air is it's very reproducible. And one of the challenges you have with bonding is you never know how much water is sitting on the dentine. And the further you get, the closer you get to the pulp, it's likely that the dentine is wetter. Now we know that bonding to different parts of dentine, depending on how close you are to the pulp, we know that bond strength as we get closer to the pulp decrease because the amount of intertubular dentine is reduced. The further you go away to the periphery of the dentine, the higher the bond strengths because you've got more intertubular dentine to bond to. These bond strengths are with no positive pulp or fluid flow. Now if we turn on the tap, if we introduce positive pulp or fluid flow, the bond strengths completely change because these bonding agents are now uptaking water and therefore when they're polymerized the physical properties of the bond layer are not as good. And what we found with G-Bond is that excessive water was not a problem because we had a technique of blasting with air that removed the water. So this gave us, gave us a way of being able to apply a bonding agent in a very consistent way 
and it didn't matter what the variation was on the surface of the tooth, we could deal with it and we can get consistent adhesion. Now how has it performed over time? Did, we, this, did this development in 2004 turn out to be as good as we thought it would be? And the answer is yes, it did. The most recent systematic review from the Leuven group, who re re redo the systematic review every five years, looked at the clinical effectiveness of dentine bonding agents and reported on which adhesives, if you like, were the top performing. And if we take the annual failure rates of bonding agents that have been included in three or more clinical trials so that there was good background data on their work, the number one ranked dentine bonding agent is in fact G-Bond now. There have been seven clinical trials. The average failure rate in those clinical trials is only 1.3 restorations per year and the standard deviation is tight. So across those seven clinical trials, it was very reproducible. This bonding agent was working. The other thing that was interesting about the uh, systematic review was just acknowledging that was there a trend in clinical performance? And yes, there was. Chemical bonding produced the best durability as a group. And that came through with glass onomer cements and the milder types of self-etching agents. And of course the milder types of self-etching agents are not demineralizing dentine and they're forming a very small, if non-existent, hybrid layer. But there were significant differences in other groups. So in other words, if you had a glass onomer, it was quite predictable. But just because you've got, say, a three-step etch and rinse, or a two-step etch and rinse, or a one-bottle etch and rinse, doesn't mean that the results were the same, because what they saw was huge variation on the effectiveness of those products within those categories or groups. Clearly from this, and clearly from clinical trials, chemical bonding is our future. So moving forward in bonding, we knew we've got a very successful formulation. So in upgrading the formulation in 2014 to Dupremia Bond, it was really essentially tweaks that we undertook. We extended the indications from self-etch and selective etch to include total etch. We were able to include it as a repair type material, but not with a silane incorporated. We're not incorporating a silane coupling agent in this adhesive because we're not able to get stability with the bond by incorporating silane with it. But this allowed us to all also use it with an appropriate resin cement for bonding of indirect restorations. Now you might wonder why we would recommend total etch technique where everything I've shown you says that you would not recommend total etch technique. We know that when you're doing a selective etch technique that sometimes you will etch dentine. And what we needed to know was can we penetrate with G Primo Bond, can we penetrate through the hybrid layer and form a nano interaction zone at the base of the hybrid layer because this would give us stability. And the answer was we could. So we're still strongly recommending, in fact, the selective etch technique where you're etching enamel and self-etching dentine we see as benchmark. But we, knew, we do know that with variation on that technique, if you are etching dentine, we're able to form a stable chemical bond zone at the base of the hybrid layer. The other area that we wanted to improve was the immediate dentine bonding capability of this adhesive. We wanted to improve how quickly and effectively it would bond. Because with a bonding agent, you apply the most stress to it when you're polymerizing the composite on top. So we give you 24 hour bond strength figures when in fact you ideally want to know two minute bond strength figures. You want to know the bond strengths of that material the moment 
you are placing composite on top and polymerizing that composite on top because it's going to put a lot of stress on the interface. Now we know that the weakness of the bonding agent at this early time is actually its cohesive strength. So in other words, if we look at the weak link, the weak link is the physical strength of that bond layer. So in searching for immediate chemical bonding, we were also looking to be able to enhance how hard we can make the bond layer. And we increased the amount of photo initiators that we're using in the bonding agent. And when you apply the bond, it looks yellow. And that's because we want maximum polymerization with this material. But of course, on light curing, that yellow disappears. The other thing we do, which is incredibly important, is we put our latest filler technology in it. And this is single dispersion nanofiller. And single dispersion nanofiller looks like this. These are very, very fine glass particles, individually silane treated. And what makes this different is this is not clumped in any way. In all previous technologies, have been using clumping techniques or clumped fillers techniques as fillers. Single dispersion nanofiller allows us to have a very, very low film thickness. We're talking about only three micron film thickness, but allows us to have a very strong bond interface. This means what we're looking for is immediate bond strength, the capability to get high bond strengths straight away. And what we've seen in looking at data on immediate bond strength and shortened application time, certainly the G Premier bond has performed very well. But more importantly, and what was important from this trial, was looking at micro tensile bond strengths to burr cut dentine. Because I know we give you bond strength figures and they're all on nice, highly polished surface. But what's really important to you is what do these bond strengths look like when I want to apply to the real dentine that I cut in a normal cavity. And certainly G Premier Bond has been able to fulfill that need. In moving on, I want to talk about composites now. And as, a, as an introduction to that, I will say that the systematic review, the 2014 systematic review on bonding also looked at what were the successful composites that were used. Because we do understand We've got bond degradation and composite degradation as well. Now, OK, admittedly, we were paired up with the best bonding agent, but certainly GC's composite technology matched the requirements of what we need. And what we're looking at here is ongoing work on silane technology to ensure that the composites we make are stable and durable. So in looking at our composite technology, not only were we looking at improving silane and how we apply silane, we looked at how we developed the filler technology. And I talked about single dispersion nanofiller. What are we trying to do? Well, when we talk about and we imagine filler particles, and we imagine that these three materials all have 2% filler loading by volume. So I, I, I know you, you know, we get asked, what's the filler loading by volume of these materials? Well, we're interested in the filler loading by volume, but we're more interested in what is the particle and how those particles grouped in that material. Because we can have 5 micron particle, or 0.5 micron, or 0.05 micron, 50 nanometer particles. And if we've got these individually dispersed, and even though we've got the same filler loading, the physical properties of this material are quite superior to the physical properties of this material. And we saw that we could get distinct benefits by decreasing the distance between particles. So this is hypothetical pictures. What we, when we relate that to a composite and think about filler in a composite resin, when we apply stress to a material, stress is able to propagate through the resin and it, then it hits a particle and that particle acts as a disruptor. So we want to shorten the particle distance, the interparticle distance. So single dispersion nanofiller technology is about bringing particles as close as possible together. And each of those particles is bonded into the matrix. In this technology, which GC have invested heavily in, 
allows us to move forward into some really exciting technology materials. We could apply it to the G Primo bond so that we could have a three micron thick bonding layer but incredibly strong. We applied it to a coating material, G Coat Plus, and I'm sure many of you have come across this material as a high strength coating material used on top of glass on cements to give it very high wear resistance. And the difference being that we were able to disperse individual nanofillers as opposed to the clumped nanofiller technology which is used in other nanofiller technology and this allowed us to get a coating that meant we could have high wear resistance uh, applied to the glass on a cement which was particularly important in the first six months of a glass on a placement when it is perhaps not as strong and more susceptible to wear if placed in a closal situation. And we see the same formulation or modification of it applied into a material equia coat which is used as part of the equia system. And when we look under high magnification and this is where we've etch the surface so you can see the fillers, this is the sort of density that is going through the material and we can apply that in other materials as well. We applied it to a coating material called Optiglaze Color which allows us to characterize resin or acrylic materials. We can apply that say to a composite or acrylic to characterize in an implant situation whether it's a temporary or a permanent highly wear resistant and we can apply it say in a partial denture system situation where this acrylic tooth can be characterized except in this situation it's not just a surface characterization that runs the risk of being brushed off it's a characterization that is going to be long lasting because it's so wear resistant. We further developed this technology and applied it to a composite single dispersion nanofiller applied to a composite. We started with liquid materials and this technology is limiting. The technology is limiting in that we've started with liquids and it's very difficult to make a paste. So the next material that actually came through was a material that you would describe as an injectable composite. It's called Genial Universal Flow. In this material introduced high density very fine glass fillers and all of these glass fillers are individually silenated and this is quite different say to a clustered nanofiller technology. The difference being that clustered nanofiller technology these particles are silane treated so rather than an individual particle in a cluster being silane treated the cluster itself is treated. So when we look at this sort of surface we see silanes applied to the outside and it means that this bonding of this particle on the inside and where we wear through that say that we run into silane rich and silane poor and silane non-existent areas. What that means is that potentially that can leave surfaces that are more susceptible to degradation and we've seen this and published in published in work looking at water uptake of this sort of structure. We can see that the materials will break down over time. And this is a measurement of biaxial flexural strength following storage of composite restoration or composite resin material from 24 hours through to 12 months. And simply measuring what happens to the flexural strength of these materials as they uptake water and break down the bond between resin and filler particles. And this is Z250, this is uh, the Filtex Supreme body shade and the translucent shade, the classic of the clustered nanofill structure. So when we test our materials we put data out as what the flexural strength of our material is but actually the really important material for us is what is the information is what is the flexural strength of the material after thermal cycling, after aging. That's what's interesting for us. And so in the technologies and materials that we've produced we've all, always sought to find out 
how well, how much does the material degrade from 100% what its physical properties were in day one to what its physical properties are after going through a 10,000 cycle thermocycling degradation. And GC has done very well as an indicator of manufacturing technology, of silane technology, of being resistant to degradation. When we look at general universal flow and the advantage of these fillers and relate it, say, to a hybrid structure, sorry, and relating it to a hybrid structure like this, the classic hybrid structure would be, say, Herculite, the first of the submicron hybrids. So this is just a hypothetical space, a volume, whereby you would fit two Herculite particles into it. The same volume with the new filler technology, even though the filler loading is lower by volume, we get much more particles, 53 particles we fit into the same space. So the important thing here is seeing the benefit of close into particle space and also recognizing that just the filler loading by volume is not an indicator of what a material's characteristics are going to be. So we were able to introduce a material called genial universal flow with this technology. And its name is really not a good name because genial universal flow suggests that as a flowable it has less physical properties. But in fact that's wrong. This was our strongest composite at that time. This was the strongest composite we could make. It was a injectable composite that we could apply in any classification of cavity very comfortably. It had beautiful aesthetics and yet because the particle size was so fine we had something that would polish beautifully. When we looked at comparative flexural strength to a range of full strength paste composites or flowables, it really stood at the top, a real benchmark. And most importantly, we had an aesthetic restorative material that was very quick and simple to place. And subsequent from its release, we've seen a couple of published clinical trials one comparing over three years, comparing it with the Estelite Sigma, performed equally as well. But an important advantage highlighted in the paper was that this composite, its handling characteristics provide a saving in chair side time. They're very quick and very simple to apply. The other clinical trial was comparing it to Heliomolar, you know, again, a benchmark in posterior composite restorations. The genial universal flow in this trial is known as mi fill. But what was important was the margins looked better. And they acknowledged it's well known that this type of flowable composites better wettability to the cavity wall than the paste type composites, which might have contributed to that result. And what was also good about this, even though both materials performed extremely well and there was no difference in them, aesthetically the mi fill was looking much better. So this technology has worked. It's really worked and it's been a technology that has allowed us to place or allowed clinicians to place restorations very quickly and clinically they've performed and they look great because of the polish retention over time. Well the next step on from the genial universal flow is the new technology, the upgraded technology called genial universal injectable. And this upgrade is now our strongest composite that we've made. So this is our benchmark material as far as strength is concerned and certainly it means it can be applied in any classification of cavity. The beauty of this material though is in its application. The real secret to why this material is so good and user friendly is the fact that it uses a direct, a direct injection technique. This way, clinician can be very fast and have pinpoint accuracy at placing the material. And we've designed the material so that it has no slump. So you can inject it, it will flow and wet, but it doesn't slump. So you can place it and it will hold where it's placed extremely well. Applying it is effortless. 
And because you're applying directly in the cavity and only using the material that you want, you've got less waste. You really do minimise the waste. The structural material, the technology we've used, it means that it's not only high strength, but it's beautiful. Self-polishing, highly aesthetic. In looking at a transition the market, I want to tell you about what's happened in the Australian market by describing a fact that we saw that over 10% of the market were choosing flowables, typically in a classic flowable situation, the bulk of the market, 90% is conventional. With the advent of the genial universal flow, we now have the major retailer in Australia, it's there now their top selling composite material. And we have a whole market here of injectable composite. We're maybe closer to 20% of the market is now choosing to place an injectable rather than placing a conventional composite. But we're certainly not advanced because if you go to Japan, you actually find that only a third of the market is placing conventional composite now. Because two thirds of the market are placing flyable injectable composite restoration, uh, restorative materials. And the bulk of these are what we would describe as injectable, full strength composite, which has all the convenience of being applied by an injectable technique. And so we see, we can imagine that this is exactly what's going to happen in future. The markets are going to move towards the injectable composite. But really, you've got to ask, why is that happening? Why is this a strong trend to injectable? Well, why is there a trend to anything? And I was thinking about cars. In Australia, in 2017, it was the first year that SUVs overtook passenger cars to be the number one selling type of vehicle that you want to drive in, which is quite amazing because actually when you think about it, the first SUV was a Land Rover or a Jeep. So the SUV has obviously emerged into something a bit prettier nowadays, but why has it moved? I mean, a passenger car does the job. It certainly, well in most cases, it's faster. Aerodynamics is closer to the ground. If you want a bit more space, you've just got a station wagon. And if you wanted to go off-road, well, you've got a four-wheel drive. And that got you in a higher seating position and all the capabilities of going off-road. But somehow, that combination of all those things ended up into an SUV that says, that does the job for me. And it was the consumer that said that. It was the people who went through the experience of sitting a bit higher when they drive, of loading the kids in, in and out of the back seat, or loading the shopping in or going away on holiday, that meant that the SUV found its place, and I'm sure it will continue to grow. And you know it's a trend and not a fad when there's a Rolls-Royce version of it as well. Interesting. What about coffee? 30 years ago, I was drinking International Roast. I went slightly up market. This brand, Makona, very nice. But really, things got interesting when we could buy our own coffee machines and we could grind our beans at home. But I can tell you, in the Australian market, it's all moved. Not all moved, but it's moved to Nespresso. And Nespresso are dominant. You can get nice new machines and new technology. But the reason why was because we wanted the flavour of our own coffee, of our own brewed coffee. But actually we wanted the convenience of instant. <laughs> we didn't want to go through the hassle of grinding beans, etc. And we wanted that ability to vary the flavour as well. Very interesting. And Nespresso continues to grow and grow and grow. So injectable composite. I mean, paste composite has been our mainstay. This has been the main reason why, the main way people have bought composite. You take composite, dental assistant is dispensing it, say, on a pad. They might roll it in a sausage. It's then picked up with an instrument and taken to the tooth. And then once it's at the tooth, it's then condensed, placed, adapted. 
And some have preferred that they can inject it in. They, they like the fact that the composite is going directly into the tooth and so we, we have compules that we apply in our materials so that they can inject directly into the tooth. But the problem is you, you've got either wastage here or you're tempted to reuse the compule and we've, we're caught with tips that don't really get the material to adapt or place the material to the cavity floor, particularly the base of the proximal box. But this has been the way people have bought composites and this is why manufacturers have produced composites in this form. The introduction of Genial Universal Flow was a full strength composite that you could inject. It was quite firm to inject though. So we had to make a, a, a special tip that screwed on very tight to take the pressure and we had to encourage dentists to be able to position it into the palm of their hand, palm of their thumb, to get the pressure on because it was too hard to dispense with the fingertip. The characteristic we found is once clinicians started injecting, it's so convenient, it's so easy. From a sterilization point of view, they could bag this and simply dispose of the tip. The important thing that's happened with Genial Universal Injectable is being able to get the material so that we can dispense it with fingertip. To be able to introduce metal tips, including a long metal tip, so that we can get the material anywhere that we need to go and effortlessly dispense it. And most importantly, we were able to adjust the handling characteristics of the material so that it didn't slump. So we have with this material the ability to get something direct to the cavity with pinpoint placement without slumping. And you can adapt, shape and contour while you inject. It is incredibly quick to place because you place and adapt and shape as you're injecting. And then you like your. And the beauty of this is there's less waste this way. You're not dispensing and throwing away composite. You're only using what you need. And this, in particular, I think is important in proximal areas because this is the problem area that we're starting to see more of. And this is clinician's report, June 2018, looking at what they describe as the epidemic of cervical caries because we can only assume incorrect placement or incorrect polymerization or not full polymerization of the resin at that critical base of the interproximal box. And so the advantage of having a tip that can go anywhere, that can be bent to any shape, is that we can get a full strength material to adapt and to be placed at the base of the proximal box and yet we've got a material that stacks and doesn't slump. Genial Universal Injectable comes in a range of shades and so you can get single packs of all the shades which include opaque shades and outside enamel shades and we do bulk packs for the popular A1 and A2 and A3 shades and it's got a three year shelf life. But Looking beyond those characteristics, what's the technology inside? Of course, we're using a silane technology, but we've gone even finer in particle size. We're looking at an average particle size that at 200 nanometers in genial universal flow has further decreased down to 150 nanometers. Particles are getting closer together. Polish is getting even better. And that sits also, we've increased the radiopacity, and that sits in comparison to clump nanofiller technology or more traditional hybrid technology. And when we look at the physical properties and when we test flexural strength of the Genial Universal Injectable versus a full range of different paste materials from different manufacturers, you can see the significance of this technology in looking at flexural strength. So if we were back talking about SUVs, we're talking about the Tesla, Tesla Model X, 0 to 103.2 seconds. This is the best, this is the fastest. When we look at wear, of course, 
because of the silane technology and the filler particle size, wear resistance is extremely good, wear loss very low. In looking at the filler technology, we're using filler technology which uses glass fillers and even finer nano fillers, but predominantly these glass fillers, they're all silane treated. We're looking at using glass filler under 400 nanometer in size, and the reason why we want to do that is because of the way light moves through this material. And we're looking specifically at the needs for aesthetic composite restorations. It also means polish retention and wear resistance is extremely good. And this sort of silane technology means that we've got resistance to degradation. And the advantage of a shape that is slightly irregular is it offers some resistance, some physical resistance to dislodgement. And we find that this combination of technologies is the best technology that we can get to get the best in terms of polish and wear resistance. Of course, when we look at classic hybrids, certainly we can make strong materials, but they don't polish well, they don't hold their polish well. Clustered nanofillers, very good polish, but inconsistent in how silane is applied to this cluster. And we look at a material, say as an example, like Estelite Sigma Quick. Nice concept with zirconia particles, circular. But unless these particles are well bonded and tightly bonded into resin matrix, the material is going to degrade. And we might see that in clinical scenarios, and this is looking as an example, just a clinical scenario where material has degraded over a year, looking at the performance, say, of estelite, asteria, and genial posterior. We're simply looking in this mouth, this is in the same patient's mouth, split mouth, we're simply seeing loss of particles from the surface for whatever reason is going on in that mouth. But this directly reflects on the silane technology and, if anything, manufacturing technology, the composite restorations, which is an area that we're constantly looking to improve. Again, the genial universal injectable, we're using newer silane technology. So when we look at how much this material will degrade from 100%, quite exciting, the degradation over our standard 10,000 thermocycling is minuscule. And again, reflecting on the desire to produce more stable composites, more resistant to water breakdown and degradation. And when we look at the actual figures, rather than using a percentage, we're looking at what does this material look like compared to other materials after they've gone through a degradation process. And so for us, this is telling us about what we can expect long term with this technology. I'll share a couple of clinical cases from Don, Dr. Anthony Mack. And here we're looking at a bi, uh, an occlusion that's been uh, raised, increased using genuine universal injectable as part of a full mouth rehabilitation. And here we're looking at anterior restorations. This is a two layer build up with characterization on the outside. Again, beautiful aesthetics. In finishing, I know when we talk about injectable composites, there's always a question mark asked, these materials flow more, don't they shrink more? Isn't this more of a problem? And and I, I want to use a bulk fill composite uh, because bulk fill composites, you know, they seem to be the latest technology and they shrink less than others. Okay. Well, when we look at this, and uh, I can hypothetically call this material then a genial bulk injectable, if you like. But when we look at this, as you can see, if I compare to a full range of injectable bulk fill materials and paste bulk fill materials, we can see that the physical properties, certainly from a flexural strength with this technology, are superior. But when we look at shrinkage, we see actually that these bulk fill materials with low shrinkage volume, that still the genial universal injectable, is very comparable to the injectable materials. 
But more importantly, when we look at shrinkage stress, and this is the stress put on the bonded interface, and we can see that this material, even when filled in bulk, is performing on a par, if not better, than many of the bulk filled materials on the market already. But it's not a bulk filled material. We're still recommending this material is placed in increments. But this technology is certainly not a technology that's putting excessive stress on the adhesive interface when it's polymerized. So thank you for listening to this presentation today. Um, we're very proud to introduce the Genial Universal Injectable Material. It is the latest technology, our strongest composite, but more importantly, as a technique for placing composite, we really see the injectable technique as being the future of placement procedures, clinic, clinical placement procedures. Thank you.